going to talk about and review the stroke protocol and some of the changes that are being made to the race exam. Uh, for about the last year and a half, two years, we've been utilizing the race exam and all that data we've been collecting, we found out some very interesting information and points. And today we're going to share with you what those points are and kind of include the race exam into a real scenario so you can see how to incorporate it in your daily works. The first thing I want to start off with today is talking about what is our inclusion criteria for a stroke alert. Now our inclusion criteria for a stroke alert is going to be any abnormality with that race exam. In addition, we've included in our protocol the ability for paramedic judgment. And Dr. Rosenblatt is going to go ahead and discuss about the other signs and symptoms that you can utilize for making that decision to call a stroke alert based on paramedic judgment. Let's talk about the other criteria for inclusion of calling a stroke alert. The next one is a glucose level of greater than 60 milligrams per deciliter. Now the reason for that criteria being included in there is because we want to make sure that the patient isn't having mimic symptoms from a hypoglycemic situation. That's why you got to have it greater than 60 milligrams per deciliter. The last and final criteria for the inclusion is going to be a time frame of 24 hours last known well time. Now, the, what that means is, is that basically, let's say that the patient went to bed at 8 o'clock at night. This morning, they woke up at 8 in the morning, and this morning, they have stroke-like symptoms, but they were fine at 8 o'clock last night. So it's about a 12-hour time period. They meet, they're in between that 24-hour time period to go ahead and call that it's a stroke alert. But let's take a different situation. Let's say the last known well time was two days ago, and the family decided to call rescue today that wouldn't be considered a stroke alert at that point because it's outside that 24-hour window. Now, why do we have such a long time frame compared to other things that are out there, other protocols that are out there? The reason is, is there are some situations where the collateral circulation and with the imaging that we're able to do nowadays, we can identify a penumbra area that has got a salvageable area for treatment and intervention. So, and we found that in some cases it can go beyond that four and a half time frame that we can do. So as a result of that, we're now studying to see how many people can fall into that range of the 24 hours and if that's a viable time frame. And that's why we're using that 24 hour clock. So we're gonna go ahead and turn it over now and discuss about some of the other symptoms that we would be looking for to make that paramedic judgment. As Tim had mentioned, some changes that are going on relating to stroke and when we create these types of protocols, um, it doesn't always reflect reality. A lot of times our patients fall into a gray area and you can't fit them into the category. Uh, we're going to rely on your judgment to say, hey, it doesn't meet the criteria for the race scale, but I think there's something neurologic or a stroke in progress. Where the race criteria really looks at uh, weakness, uh, facial asymmetry, um, gaze deviation and uh, some other cortical signs that we'll go into detail, it doesn't uh, articulate other things that might be related to stroke. I think the most common one is probably dizziness. Someone has imbalance and dizziness, um, it's something that could represent a stroke, especially in the posterior circulation dealing with the cerebellum, it's not included in a race. If you guys see someone who's dizzy, maybe has some nausea, vomiting, um, and you think, okay, it's not alcohol related, it's not a drug overdose, um, I think this is something neurologic. Um, this is someone you can consider um, contacting Dr. Meta or at least uh, recognizing that this is a possible stroke. Um, other things such as severe headache or if you see someone with posturing, it could represent a stroke that's hemorrhagic. Uh, it could represent a, a traumatic uh, bleed in the head. Those are other things to keep into the category of possible neurologic symptoms that might need to be, uh, might require a stroke activation. Um, also sensory loss. Um, someone comes in saying, I can't feel half my face. It might be something simple like Bell's palsy, but it also might uh, represent a stroke that doesn't have uh, exact uh, criteria for race, but represent something that's uh, stroke and would require activation. Um, so it's important to recognize while the criteria for race and activation is there, we also want you to think outside of the box. If someone presents with any other of these other types of symptoms, you should also consider activating stroke or at least discussing it with the neurointerventionalist who's available to you. Um, other things I've mentioned or touched on that mimic stroke, obviously hypoglycemia, like you mentioned, if the sugar is too low, can look like a stroke. 
post-seizure. They can just be like an altered mental status, which might represent a stroke, but might represent a drug overdose, alcohol intoxication, metabolic disturbances. Those are all things that could look like stroke. So make sure you uh, consider that. Sometimes atypical migraines, headaches that cause um, sensory deficit or hemiplegia could be a migraine, could be a stroke. So just be aware that there are other things that can look like a stroke. When in doubt, we'd prefer that you activate, but still we want to make sure that you understand that it's not just the race criteria that means stroke. There's other things as well. Um, I think it's important also to emphasize, as we touch on race, why these changes are happening. In other words, our protocols were just out less than a year. Why are you seeing this? Um, and the reason is because of the feedback that we've gotten that the race has been excellent, but there are certain things that are more sensitive for large vessel occlusion. Those are the types of strokes where the neurointerventional teams actually have the ability to make a larger impact. Tim had mentioned things along the lines of if you have collateral circulation, the time frame might be longer because you have other blood vessels supplying the injured or ischemic brain, but they're not quite dead yet. But also, there are certain signs, specifically the cortical signs, things like eye deviation, agnosia, aphasia, those things are actually more sensitive for large vessel occlusions, at least the types of strokes that we can have the biggest impact on. So the reason why we're changing this scale is because over the last year and a half, we've accumulated enough data to show that if we focus on those types of cortical defects, we're more likely to activate a stroke that may not meet the five criteria or the, the score of five, but has one of the important cortical signs and that's why we're changing it so that we're going to get the best patient outcome for these types of events. So, Doc, uh, just to kind of recap, because we're, we're talking about large vessel occlusion, and that may be a new terminology for some people out there today. We, we've always known about stroke alerts and calling the stroke alert, and th these are patients that may ha have either a blockage or a bleed in the brain. But now we're starting to expand on that criteria. We're starting to get a little bit more specific. There is a population out there that have what we call large vessel occlusions. And trying to identify that is important because of the treatment options. What are some of those treatment options that are occurring and why it's important for us to identify a large vessel occlusion versus just calling the stroke alert? Okay. So think, I like to think of the uh, circulatory system of the brain almost like a tree. It starts off with a big trunk then it goes to medium-sized branches and smaller and smaller branches till you reach the leaves. So your carotids and your vertebral arteries are the large trunk, and then it goes smaller and smaller and smaller. The more proximal or the larger the vessel, so if you hit the main trunk, like a carotid or vertebral artery, and you get a blockage there, it's easier to use a catheter in a neurointerventional app to grab that uh, clot and uh, remove it. The further you go into the tree and the smaller the vessel is, the, the caliber of the vessel gets so narrow that you can't put a catheter in. Now, if you have a small vessel occlusion, first of all, the area that it perfuses is smaller. So if you hit a, a, a branch that's all the way at the tip of the tree near the, you know, you might hit a couple of leaves versus if you hit the trunk, the whole tree goes. So the cortical signs are more indicative of a blockage that happens in the bigger vessels. And those are the ones that the neurointerventionalists can actually access with a catheter and suck out that clot. Um, with TPA, when we're giving clot-busting drugs, those work well for small little clots that are at the end because it doesn't have to uh, break up a small, uh, in a small vessel, there isn't a lot of clot burden. So the medication can go and break up a tiny clot. But if you have this big blockage in a major artery, the, the TPA won't work well. But what does work well is mechanical removal with the, the tools that the neurointerventionalists use. So that's why they're really focusing on these large vessel occlusions because it, 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 it's responsible for a larger part of the brain and it's also more amenable to repair with these mechanical devices. Don't forget about that there is a very small section, but it can happen that pediatrics can have a stroke too. So let's talk a little bit about the pediatrics and some of the things we may see or encounter with that. Absolutely, so a, a pediatric stroke is gonna be a very rare event. But I think it's worthwhile mentioning because we want to be comprehensive. We're talking about stroke, um, and the, the one time you might see it in your career, at least you, know, you will be aware of the fact that strokes can happen in children. Um, and the important points are that what types of kids would get stroke? It's much more likely that they are hypoglycemic and diabetic. It's much more likely that they have trauma uh, that's causing a bleed uh, or a seizure that's mimicking a stroke. But 
it's still something that you should include in your differential. So certain risk factors when you're getting your history, if they have congenital heart disease, specifically a connection of the right side of the heart to the left side, a PFO, a patent for Raymond O'Valley, which means that the atrium connect, they can in theory have a hypercoagulable state, something like sickle cell or a factor V or different you know, types of uh, blood clotting disorders that a blood clot starts on the right side, normally it would go, turn into a pulmonary embolism because it gets caught in the lung, but because they have the congenital heart, it travels from the right side to the left side, and then that emboli shoots off into the brain. So if you see kids with congenital heart disease with stroke-like symptoms, or they have other things like sickle cell, diabetes, um, uh, uh, vascular uh, pathies like uh, 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 you know, uh, people with autoimmune disease, those types of rare occurrences plus stroke-like symptoms at least included in your differential. When kids do present with stroke, it has sometimes they'll present with a seizure first, uh, which makes it complicated, uh, but sometimes they'll present with typical stroke symptoms like they can't move half their body or they're having difficulty with speech where normally they're able to enunciate their words well. Um, in those cases, if you're really suspecting stroke, you can certainly call that same cell phone number for the neurointerventionist because the only facility that you can transport that one would be Joe DiMaggio because even though we have other pediatric ERs, the other ones can't handle the, you know, the actual interventional if they require it. So if you suspect a potential stroke, which again would be very rare, you have access to that phone number and if they agree, hey, this sounds like a potential stroke, you would probably transfer it all over uh, to East to uh, Joe DiMaggio. So let's talk about the protocol. As you can see so far, the main focus is really doing the assessment to identify the stroke patient. Some of the things to consider though, while, as you're treating and transporting these patients, uh, we wanna make sure that they're elevated about a 30 degree angle when we're transporting them. We wanna monitor the SAO2, and we wanna make sure that it's right around 94%. Our goal is not to get them up to 100% oxygen. So the only time we're gonna give oxygen to these patients if they're less than 94%. And lastly, you want to consider if there's any additional airway intervention that you're going to do. If you have somebody that's in respiratory distress, you may have to go ahead and bag these patients or insert an advanced airway. Last, let's talk about the telemetry. So the stroke alert is going to be utilized when we call into the telemetry, and we're going to notify the hospital that we're bringing them a stroke alert. And this lets them start to activate their stroke team and get them ready for when we get at the hospital. But what about calling Dr. Mehta? Well, we, as we talked about before, if we see these cortical signs, that's when we're gonna go ahead and call Dr. Mehta. And we wanna do that as soon as we recognize those symptoms. So you find during your assessment, somebody may have some gaze going on or uh, some agnosia symptoms. We wanna go ahead and call him right away and brief him, consult with him, let him know what we have. If you can't get a hold of him, not a problem. Just let the hospital know that. And what we're adding into this to kind of flag for the hospital, a patient that may meet these elbow criteria, is what we call race plus. So when you do your telemetry, you're going to give the race score, and then you're going to add a plus sign, which is going to indicate to the hospital that they're meeting that cortical symptoms or signs. Now, we're going to go ahead and provide you with a scenario to kind of show you how to incorporate this assessment. And Dr. Med is going to add on how to score it. Good morning. Hi, good morning. She's right in that office. She fell and I can't get her back up. Good morning, ma'am. How are you? We're going to Good morning. How can I help you? Okay. I got up and I was ready to go somewhere and I fell. Ma'am, did you lose consciousness or anything? No. You have any neck or back pain? No. No? Okay. Do you, do you have any past medical history that we should know about? No, nothing. I never had any problems. Did you take any medication or anything? No. No, any allergies to any medication or anything? No. No? Not that I know of, no. Okay, ma'am, we're going to go ahead and get some vital signs on you, okay? Hello, I'm Dr. Brijesh Mehta, Neurointerventional Surgeon and Director of Stroke and Neurocritical Care at the Memorial Healthcare System. In this segment, we will be going over specific questions to assess stroke alert patient in the field, such as last seen normal time, determined by asking the patient if they're able to state that reliably or to bystanders or family members, because determining symptom onset time is invaluable to the receiving hospital for uh, receiving time-sensitive therapy, such as IVTPA. The medications the patients are on, again, such as uh, blood thinners, Coumadin, Prodaxa, Xarelto, some of the newer oral anticoagulants, also will help the receiving hospital determine whether a patient may be eligible for IVTPA or not. 
And then finally, blood glucose level in the field to ensure that the patient does not have over hypoglycemia or hyperglycemia, uh, which can sometimes bring on a stroke mimic-like symptoms. And this information essentially can be conveyed to the hospital while you're en route. Ma'am, are you able to stand up? I don't have any strength to no? get up. I don't, I don't think I can do it. Okay, well, me and my partner, we're gonna help you onto the stretch, okay, for facilitate any further evaluation that we have to do, okay? Okay. At this point, the medics have determined that the patient is experiencing uh, potential stroke-like symptoms. Therefore, they're going to proceed to evaluating the patient using the race scale. The first component is to assess for facial palsy. Good morning, ma'am. We're going to be doing some exams, okay? I want you to follow my command. The first exam I want you to do is give me a big smile. As you're doing that, show me your teeth. Okay, very good. Relax. As you can see here, the patient did not demonstrate any facial asymmetry and therefore would get zero points for absence of a facial palsy. In situations where patient does have some mild facial asymmetry, it would be graded as one point uh, because there is some presence of a crease on the affected side of the face, but it's not fully symmetric to the other side. In a circumstance where there's complete flattening of the nasolabial fold, meaning uh, there is no uh, crease whatsoever, uh, that would be graded as moderate to severe facial palsy and be assigned two points. Okay, ma'am, the next test that we're going to do, I'm gonna ask you to hold both arms straight out for 10 seconds, okay? Go ahead and do that for me, please. And let me assist you with your left arm. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Go ahead and relax your right arm. Let me help you out. Thank you. For this component, the medics are assessing arm strength. And so they ask the patient to lift both arms uh, and determine if the patient can hold it up for at least 10 seconds. As you can see, the patient holds up the right arm and can keep it up for at least 10 seconds. When prompted, the patient cannot lift up the left arm whatsoever, and therefore the medic assists the patient and immediately falls back down. And therefore, there's no movement in the left arm. It will be graded as severe weakness uh, and assigned two points. In circumstances where there's some strength in the arm, the patient is able to lift it up, but cannot sustain it anti-gravity for a full 10 seconds. In those situations, it will be considered moderate weakness and be assigned one point. In a normal situation where there's equal strength in both arms and the patient can keep it up for at least 10 seconds, uh, the patient uh, is considered to have normal strength and be assigned zero points. Okay, ma'am, the next test that we're going to do, I'm gonna have you raise your right leg first 30 degrees right where my hand is. I want you to hold it for five seconds, okay? Let's go ahead and do that. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, relax your right leg. Now I want you to do the same thing with your left leg. Hold it for five seconds, right at 30 degrees. Go ahead, let me go ahead and assist you with that. Hold it for five seconds. One, two, three, okay, thank you. In this next component, the medic is assessing leg strength. So he asks the patient to lift up the right leg and then the left leg individually to assess the strength. She is able to lift up the right leg and sustain it fully anti-gravity for at least five seconds. The left leg, on the other hand, when prompted to do so by the medic, the patient is not able to lift it up herself. Therefore, he assists her in raising it anti-gravity and the leg immediately falls back down and therefore is considered severe weakness because she, there's no strength in the left leg to sustain an anti-gravity even for a couple of seconds and therefore is assigned two points. In situations where there's moderate weakness, the patient is able to lift up the left leg herself, but it falls back down to the plane of the bed in less than five seconds and therefore will be assigned one point. In a normal situation, the patient would have equal strength to the other side, her right leg, and therefore be able to sustain an anti-gravity for a full five seconds. The next raise exam will determine if there's any eyes or head gaze deviation. In the next component, the medic is assessing for any head and gaze deviation. 
What that means is, is there any forced deviation of both eyes as well as the patient's head to one side or the other? When head and gaze deviation are present, when asking the patient to follow your commands and look to both sides, including the other side from where they're looking, it's important to go to the side of the bed where they're primarily uh, uh, oriented, meaning that if their head and gaze is turned towards the right side, you want to go to the right side of the stretcher and look at them and ask them to look towards the left side, see if they can cross the midline. If you, on the other hand, go to the side where they're not looking, the patient is not going to be able to see you and able to follow your commands and it may result in an inaccurate assessment. Overall, the head and gaze deviation is considered the most important predictor of the presence of a large vessel occlusion. And that's why it's important to perform this exam accurately. In this situation, the patient is looking straight ahead and is able to cross midline and look to both sides of her body. And therefore, there's absence of head and gaze deviation and she would be assigned zero points. In a situation where the patient is looking primarily towards the right side and the head towards the right side, they would be considered to have left-sided weakness because head and gaze deviation is always opposite the side of the weakness and be assigned a one point. In a situation where the patient's head and gaze are turned forced to the left side, they would be assessed to have right-sided weakness and therefore be assigned one point. And so this is all part of what we call a stroke syndrome where the head and gaze deviation is always opposite of the side of the weakness. And so again, as a reminder, important to assess the patient on the side where their head and eyes are turned. Okay, ma'am, next I want you to go ahead and close your eyes for me. Okay, open your eyes, thank you. Next, I want you to hold up your right arm and make a fist, can you do that? Thank you, relax your right arm. Can you tell me what I'm holding in my hand? That's a pen. Very good. And lastly, I want to ask you, repeat after me, today is a sunny day. Today is a sunny day. Thank you. In this next segment, the medic is assessing for aphasia. Aphasia means ability to talk or follow commands. And so that's called expressive, the ability to talk and follow commands, receptive aphasia. So in this situation, the medic is going to ask several questions and determine if the patient has expressive and or receptive aphasia. So the first line of questions is to assess if the patient is able to follow commands. And so he asks the patient to close eyes and make a fist. As you can see, the patient is able to do both appropriately and therefore does not have any receptive aphasia. The next component he's testing for is the expressive aphasia. So he's asking her to identify a pen if she can name it appropriately. She'd also ask to identify another object such as a watch to make sure that the naming is fully appropriate uh, with multiple objects, as well as he asked to repeat, today is a sunny day because repetition is also considered part of the expressive component, and so she's also able to do that appropriately. So in this situation, she does not have any aphasia, and therefore would be assigned zero points for normal language function. In a situation where there's moderate aphasia, the patient would be assigned one point. In that situation, the patient may have uh, expressive component and or a receptive component. So if any of the four questions that I just went over are answered incorrectly or followed incorrectly, then it would be assigned one point for moderate aphasia. If on the other hand, the patient has severe aphasia, that means they're unable to talk at all and not able to follow any commands appropriately, then it would be severe aphasia, meaning it's a global language dysfunction and would be assigned two points for severe aphasia. Okay, ma'am, the next exam that we're going to do is I want you to tell me Whose arm am I holding? I don't know. Okay. Is this your arm? No. Okay. Tell me, do you have any weakness in your left arm? No. In this next component, the medic is assessing for neglect or agnosia. And so what that means is asking the patient if on the side of the weakness, the patient can recognize his or her arm and whether 
they are aware of the presence of any impairment, i.e. weakness, in that arm. So the medic here is asking the patient, do you recognize your arm by lifting it up in front of their face to make sure that they appropriately see the arm and then asking the question, do you recognize your arm? The patient answers no, and so that would be considered asomatoagnosia, and so that's part of the overall uh, assessment for neglect. The next question he asks her is, are you aware of any weakness in your arm on the affected side? And she again answers no, and so that's also a sign of neglect or what's called anosagnosia. And so in this situation, the patient has severe neglect, meaning that the patient is unaware of the side of the body that's being shown, in this case, the left arm, which is affected, as well as unaware of the impairment in that arm, and therefore assign two points for severe neglect. In a situation where the patient answers one of these two questions appropriately, meaning that they're either aware of their arm or the weakness in the arm, then it would be assigned moderate uh, agnosia or neglect, meaning that only one of the two components are affected. In situations where they're able to recognize the arm and are aware of the impairment, meaning the weakness on that side, uh, there will be absence of any neglect or agnosia and will be assigned zero points. We're en route to your facility with a stroke alert. Patient had a sudden onset of weakness and fell. So after assessing the patient and evaluating the patient using the race scale assessment, the medic then conveys this information to the receiving hospital via MedCom. So the most important components to convey to the receiving hospital to allow them to prepare accordingly for potentially receiving IVP TPA as well as taking the patient immediately to the cath lab are the following. The age of the patient, the last known well time for the patient, meaning what are the time the symptoms came on? Uh, was it three hours ago, six hours ago, or is it a wake up stroke or unknown time of onset? All of that information is invaluable to the receiving hospital to determine eligibility for IVTPA and or mechanical thrombectomy in the cath lab. The next uh, information is the race score. So is the score a six or is it a six plus? So in this new race scale plus assessment, by adding a plus next to the score means that the patient has presence of cortical signs, gaze, head deviation, or aphasia, or agnosia, any or all of the above. And those are very important predictors of potential large vessel occlusion, and that will allow the receiving hospital to at least inform their neurointerventional team and potentially activate the cath lab early. Is the patient on any blood thinners, such as Coumadin, the newer oral anticoagulants such as Xarelto, Prodaxa, presence of those medications may exclude the patient from receiving IVTPA because those medications are contraindicated when giving IVTPA. And then ensuring that the patient has two peripheral IVs. IV access is critical when the patient arrives to the ER, they're taken straight to the CT scanner and many times they need the IVs present to administer IVTPA if necessary, as well as simultaneously perform a CT angiogram. Absence of the appropriate IV access really slows the process down in the hospital and adds minutes to potentially receiving the time-sensitive therapies. And finally, communicating the blood pressure as well as what the rhythm is showing on the telly is critical. If the blood pressure is really high, i.e. above 200 systolic, it could mean that the patient has a bleed in the head and not necessarily a large vessel occlusion. And finally, assessing the rhythm, if it's irregular, it could be atrial fibrillation and that could tip off that this is a potential large vessel occlusion with a clot coming from the heart. So this is overall a summary of the presence of potential uh, factors that may include or exclude the patient from receiving the time-sensitive therapies on arrival to the hospital. So over the past two years, uh, Memorial Healthcare System uh, implemented the original race scale and we collected data from every patient that had an EMS stroke alert uh, that also had a concurrent race score present. And after performing the analysis uh, over this time period, we determined that there are components of the race scale that are predictors of large vessel occlusion, as we have discussed, and specifically the presence of cortical signs, such as gaze, eye deviation, 
uh, head deviation, aphasia, as well as agnosia. When we looked at our internal data, we found that the patients who ultimately were confirmed to have a large vessel occlusion not only had a race score 5 or higher, but they had presence of any or all of these cortical signs. Therefore, we decided to add this plus nomenclature at the uh, end of the score to indicate a potential large vessel occlusion in a patient that would uh, trigger downstream activation of the cath lab. Now, what does this mean in terms of our overall impact on times to treatment? We determined that the presence of an EMS stroke alert in and of itself can significantly reduce not only the door-to-needle time for IV TPA, as it's been shown in several other large-scale studies published in the literature, but also what's new in this uh, era of mechanical thrombectomy is it can reduce time for door to treatment in the cath lab. Because of the presence of the score uh, being five or higher, predicting presence of a large vessel occlusion, we activated our cath lab when cortical signs were present uh, immediately upon receiving this information via MedCom. And as you can see, it led to significant reduction in the overall door to groin puncture time in the lab. And when we looked at our outcomes data, our outcomes were not only similar, but better compared to the randomized control trials published, which compared the mechanical thrombectomy treatment to mesh medical therapy. And so we're really proud of the work that we've done with our EMS agencies and the crews in the field who have supplied us with stroke alerts as well as the race scale uh, to determine if the patient's eligible for any of these time-sensitive therapies. So now as we transition to the race scale plus uh, scoring mechanism, I encourage you that when you call in a stroke alert via MedCom to please also supply us with the race score so that we can deliver the best care possible for our patients in a timely fashion.